Good morning, everyone. Um, so as Todd just said, I'm going to be wrapping up. I'm not bad boy to start. Okay, can you click it for us? For some reason, it's not. Like the actual one. There we go. Um, so I'm going to be wrapping up our Who Am I series. Um, and as Todd mentioned, this is something that um, it's probably actually, not probably, it is the first time that I think I've ever been the one that's kind of got the idea for the theme and God's given me certain messages throughout it. So I think that's why he sort of led me to do the sort of wrapping it up message. Um, and I knew that I was supposed to do it, but then when I came to write it, obviously I haven't had much time because we've been on holiday, but I've been thinking about it for the last few days um, and before a little bit before we went away and was like, I know that I'm supposed to be wrapping this up. And I was like, but God really needs to show me what it is that I need to be discussing, obviously, because it's all well and good going, well, we don't just fill a slot here. We're like, we do what the Lord asks us to do and we speak because God asks us to speak and gives us a message. So... Um, when I came to sit down and write it yesterday, I had a sort of vague idea of where I thought it was supposed to be going. And then when I started doing a bit more reading into it, I was like, this isn't right at all. <laughs> so I'm going to do something quite different today. Um, but I felt really strongly that this is what I was supposed to do. Um, and as I said, we don't, we're not about just preaching because this is the preaching slot. Um, if we don't have a message, we won't preach. Um, if God doesn't give us anything to say, we won't say it. Um, and that's what, how we will always stick to. Um, it's not because this is the time slot where this is the next thing that's supposed to happen. Um, so, um, I realised that a few months ago, uh, probably about nine, ten weeks ago, when we started the sermon series, I launched it and challenged us all to take a really serious, hard look at ourselves and our identity in Christ. And I asked, asked each of us to allow the Holy Spirit to break down any wrong understandings, any preconceived notions, false teachings, negative thoughts and feelings, and to rebuild our understanding in, truth, uh, um, in the truth of God's word. And I did that because, first of all, the Bible tells us to, and in Romans 12, 2, it says, don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And that was really, this sort of sums up what our aim was with this series that we've been doing. And as Christians, we often get it wrong because we're renewing our mind about how much of a failure we are, or by reinforcing all of our fears, our worries, our doubts, all the things that we can't do, and the cycle continues. And that's very dangerous because when our feelings and our thought life align with the lies of the enemy and agree with Satan's plan for our life, our thoughts follow feelings and feelings reinforce those toxic thoughts. So therefore we needed to re uh, renew our mind with the truth of how God sees us, of how loved, in valued, important, liked, useful and valuable we all are. And remember that if we had no value, why would there be a fight for our souls? If we're completely useless, nobody would be fighting over us. We need to see ourselves as our spiritual identity, as God sees us, and we need to retrain our minds and our thoughts and our souls, and we needed a re-education. So at the end of my sermon in August, I said this, until you can confidently say and know and understand who you are in Christ without dying a little or a lot on the inside, then there is still a renewing to be done. So my question to you today is, how is that going? <laughs> Has your mind been renewed? Have you been challenged by anything that's been spoken in the last couple of months? Now, I'm sure there's been the odd moment we've gone, oh, that was really interesting, or that really made me think. But has it really got deep into your soul and into your mind? And has the Holy Spirit been working through that to help change some of the mindsets? You can answer if you want, you don't have to. 
few little nods. <laughs> So God really wanted me to check in with everybody. And it's something we wouldn't normally do. Normally we just do it as sort of a conversation thing. But I felt like I was actually supposed to make this the conclusion of the sermon series. To really ask us to readdress. Because it's all well and good. You can start the... And this happens a lot, doesn't it? You start something, you set a challenge out, and you go, okay, we're really going to do this. And then we do the, you know, the do the whatever the thing is. But then often we don't conclude with it at the end and go, actually... Did anything change? And if the answer is no, we're not going to do the whole sermon series again. Don't worry, we're going to, right, we're going to keep doing it until you understand. No. I <laughs> and it's not to say that we'll never redress these topics again. This is a constant thing. You remember from Mum's sermon a couple of weeks ago, she said we're a work in progress and we'll come back to more of that um, in a while. So it's not supposed to be, I have all these negative thoughts and now I'll never, ever, ever have a negative thought. Or now I will never feel badly about myself. I will always think I'm fabulous. No, this is not how this is supposed to be. But it is supposed to make you stop and readdress and allow the Holy Spirit to work on our mindset and on our soul to change our behaviour and attitude. That's all we're asking. And that's all I'm, I'm wanting. I'm still on exactly the same journey. I'm not stood up here going, you know, I have all my ducks in a row and everything is perfect and I never feel badly of myself. If only that were true. So what we're going to do this morning is a little bit different. And we're going to recap some of the stuff that we've learned over the last eight, nine weeks. Nine, ten weeks. I shouldn't really count the weeks. I think it's about eight or nine so, I kicked it off with sort of an introduction, and then Todd followed up with, I am a new creation. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as through God we're pleasing through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Where before we were disconnected from God, through Christ we've been recreated, we've been made new, and reconnected to God, and through us in the unique plans and purposes that God has for each person who is in Christ, there is a common goal, the ministry of reconciliation. You who are in Christ, you are a minister of reconciliation. Our old life is gone, and many of the weeks talked about this. Our old life is gone. It's completely finished, gone, done, dusted, never mentioned again. And we need to understand that, and we need to live like that. We have to understand these things for many reasons. First, we must understand who we are in Christ so that we can do what he's called us to do, so that we can stand, so that we can take the authority that is ours and that we can fight the spiritual battle. So with all these things, remember that's the underpinning point of why we're doing it. The following week, Todd talked about being the head, not the tail. Does everyone remember the wagging dog video? Mm -hmm. I can't believe he's got me doing that move on Facebook as well now. Um, and that essentially was talking about not being ruled by our, our emotions or our soul, but by the Holy Spirit. And you might remember this quote. I'd actually forgotten it until I looked through the sermon notes. Um, so Todd and I had been watching a show called Snowflake Mountain which I wouldn't necessarily recommend, but it was worth, it was good. It, um, and in that, it was basically a group of young people who were very much ruled by their soul and their emotions. And one of the um, leaders of that um, said this, your emotions are the horse, but you are the jockey. Uh. And I actually felt, in summing up, I am the head but not the tail. That's really what we're saying here. 
Your emotions are the horse, but you are the jockey. I can't remember. I did put that up there. So if you let your emotions run wild, instead of you practicing leading the horse, you are being wagged by the tail. You are the tail and not the head. And you're not living out what God intends for you. This is the sign that you're living out your soul and flesh and not by the Holy Spirit, that you are on the throne of your life. When you walk by the Spirit, you obey the voice of God and you become the head, not the tail. You are called to be in control, self-control, in your life and by your own free will, living out the plans and purposes that God has called for you and living in his blessings. <coughs> Then the following week I said that I am liked by God. Controversial statement. No, really. <laughs> and after years of being a Christian, I finally understood what it meant to be liked by God. Not just loved because he had to, like some overbearing parent. We learn that through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have been justified. And this was the quote that I know mum referenced a couple of weeks ago as well. The child's definition of justified is just as if I'd never sinned. And that is that Jesus died for our sins. And when we put our faith in him, we were justified. We were freed. We were declared righteous in his sight. Sin no longer separates us from God. And we can live in a right relationship with him and with others. And that's what justification is. So God's done the work. He's completed it. In Romans 8 verse 9 we read this, but when the spirit of Christ empowers your life, you are not dominated by the flesh, but by the spirit. And that's just what we're talking about with the head, not the tail. You are dominated by the flesh, but not the spirit. And if you are not joined to the spirit of the anointed one, you are not of him. Now Christ lives his life in you. And even through your body, so even though your body may be dead because of the effects of sin, his life-giving spirit imparts life to you because you are fully accepted by God. And when we understand that God likes us, that we're loved by him, that we're liked by him, and that we're fully accepted by him, as we are, not as the future perfect self he wants us to be. And that's the common misconception. We apply our worldly mindset that says, well, people will like me if. If only I was like this, then people would like me more. If only I was better at this. If only I didn't do this. If only this wasn't my flaw. We are fully accepted by God as we are. <clears throat> and when you understand that, it's a game changer. It's a complete game changer. The following week, Todd talked about being a friend of God. And this was the week that the Queen died. And so we talked a lot about that because Todd felt very strongly that this was the sermon he was supposed to preach and that she was a very good example of somebody who was a friend of God. <coughs> but there's a different meaning than just being a friend of God. A friend of God is someone who's called to action. And the Queen used her position of power and the position of authority and the, um, the fame that she had to preach the gospel. And she used it on many different occasions and in many different ways. And in John 15, 12 through 17, it says this, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that, you lay one's, that one lays his life down for his friends. You are my friends, this is Jesus speaking, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for so the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all the things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, 
and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give you. We are called to be friends of God. He is our friend. And as his friends, he calls us to action and to bear that fruit to the world around us. And this is really what a friend of God means. It's love in action. As a friend of God, he shares with us the things he's heard from the Father. That's what this is saying. God wants to reveal his heart and his intentions and his plans to us because we are his friends. And we are a friend of God. The next week Todd spoke about being gifted by God. And not just that he's gifted by God, or that I'm gifted, or that maybe one or two of us in the room are gifted. We read in 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. As each one of us has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving the strength which God supplies. So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And often we read this sort of scripture, and there's many like it, where we ignore the first sentence and then focus on the second bit, which is like, well, what are these the ones who speak? And these are the ones who serve? And these are the ones who do this? And then you can negate your role in it. You can say, well, that's not for me. Because I'm not called to do that. Oh, that's for these specific people. I'm not called to do that. But they're the gifted ones. They're the ones that are special. I'm not special enough. I'm not gifted enough. But it says, as each one has received a special gift. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ for salvation from sin and death, you become part of the body of Christ, the church. You and I and each person who belongs to God are united and one body. Each one a member and a member of the body of Christ. Properly, these gifts are gifts of grace. They come along with salvation and they are there waiting to be opened up and put to use. Not just for the member of the body that needs them to do what it has that's been created, but also the entire body needs all of its members functioning properly with all of the gifts put to their full use at its maximum potential. Otherwise, not only a specific member of the body not functioning, as it can and should, but the entire body cannot function properly. And again, you can hear this and think, well, I'm the one now that's holding it up. I've done that. I've done that more times than I can count. I can guarantee you, if Todd will pray about something, or we're praying about something, and Todd said, well, I felt like God showed us that there's something that's hindering our progress, or there's something that's stopping this happening. I immediately think it's me. I don't even pause. I could never even possibly consider that it be Todd. And he's like looking at me, really? <laughs> because in my head, I think he's more spiritual than me. I think he's more gifted than me. We can all do it. And really, I know that actually, I'm probably equally as gifted, but in very different ways. And there are things that Todd's very, very good at that I am no good at whatsoever. And that's partly why it highlights that I don't feel like I'm good enough. <laughs> but it's just because we do things differently. There are things that he's excellent at, and there are things that I am terrible at, and there are things that I'm excellent at that he's terrible at. But it's very easy to look at your own terrible and not look at your own excellent. Right? We all look at our terrible, we're very, very, very reluctant to point out our excellent. We need to stop going down that guilt trip mindset. We should need to stop it. I've literally written, stop it. There is, I wish I could play the clip from this brilliant 
um, American comedy show from forever ago, like what was it, like the 60s, it doesn't make any difference. Yeah, I think it was the early 90s. Oh, well, <laughs> it's, anyway, I think it's supposed to be set in the 60s, isn't it? But anyway, it's, and basically this guy comes in his room and, I can't really explain it very well, but basically, she's coming and going, well I've got all these problems, I've got this situation, and the guy just sits across the desk and just goes, stop it. And then she says, yeah, but, 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 and then she said, but I've got this situation and this problem, and he just goes, stop it. And in the end, it just, he's just yelling at her, just stop it. Just stop it. I won't yell at you, just stop it. But just stop it. We all need to stop it. Can, can I share the, the actual one? Go on. Because okay. so, see, because I'm going to quote it wrong. No, no, because it's really funny. Um, <laughs> I think it's funny. Kind of oddly funny. But, um, Do it loud enough so they can hear it. So, so the sketch was is that this was a psychologist, and um, and he had the sign out in the front of his building that said um, one dollar for one minute of therapy. And um, so this woman yeah. comes in and she says, "Does that this seem like a good deal? I'll try this." And um, so she gives the dollar and, and he says, "Okay, what's your issue?" And she says, "Well, it sounds really silly, but I've got this totally irrational fear that I'm going to be buried alive in a box." And he says, and then he says. Stop it. And she goes, but, but, and she says, you're right, I just need to stop. It's totally irrational, it makes no sense. I do need to just, just stop. And she says, this is good, okay, uh, uh, you know, let's try something else. And she gives him another dollar and they have another minute. And she comes up with these issues and he, again he says, stop it. And they do like two or three more and then finally she's like, well doctor, I don't think this is the answer to everything. You can't just say stop it to everything that I say. And then she, uh, and then he says, Stop it, or I'll bury you alive in a box. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to bury you alive in a box today. <laughs> Todd did tell, tell that story a lot better than I see. He's better than me now. <laughs> but we do. We need to stop with the negative mindset. We need to stop with the lies, because it is a lie. There is absolutely no evidence for that behaviour anywhere in Scripture. There is no justification for it. There's no evidence for it. There's no justification for it. We are not messed up, screwed up people that are completely worthless. We have a very, very unique, important role to play in the lives of those around us and in the body of Christ. And this isn't a guilt trip you'd say, well, if you're still dealing with stuff, then you're a hot mess and you're ruining the whole church. That's not it either. Don't go down that route. The fingers out. Do not go down that route. We are all a work in progress. We are all on a journey together. And while on that journey, we have a role to play. We have something to contribute that is of value and that is of worth to all of those around us. Todd then did the following move. I am commissioned by Christ. In Matthew 5, 13 to 16, it says this. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by man. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor, do, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, can anybody remember what the end of this sermon ended with? If you can. Sing it. <laughs> Lynn's like, I'm not singing it. <laughs> <laughs> this little light of mine, I'm gonna shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. <clears throat> we all have a job to do and a specific role to play in the world with the people God brings in our lives. God has called us and he has commissioned us to do that role. And we have to allow our light to shine. That's why we did the little light bulb video walking down the street. 
God didn't mess it up. He uniquely created each one of us. He called each one of us. He commissioned each one of us. And he gifted us for a specific purpose. And now, at this point, you can be right, but I don't know what that specific purpose is. And I would say, don't let that be the hindrance. Your specific purpose might be to attend church on a Sunday morning. I'm not saying that's the only thing God has in your life. But how about get up and function in my family? How about go to work and to be with the people I'm at work with? How about go to the grocery store and do and run some errands? How about go into my into a shop and interact with the person there? It doesn't mean you have to have this great big vision and you have to travel the world changing people's lives left, right and centre from a big platform. That is not what a unique purpose and calling to be commissioned for has to look like. None of us have that role. That is not the reality of my life. 95% of the time I get up and I get dressed in the same clothes and I go and do the same job every day. And yes, I don't know there who I'm going to interact with apart from my colleagues. I don't know what the day is going to hold and I don't know what that might look like. But that is where I'm called. That is where I'm commissioned. That is where I'm gifted in this season. And that's what I do. It might not look glamorous. It might not look how you think it's going to look. And in, for 99% of Christians, it doesn't look like a big platform ministry. They are not the world changers. They are not the game changers. They have a very significant role to play. And God has given them that platform for a reason and for a time. And for a purpose. But it is no less important than the role that you have. The next week Todd talked about I am strong in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10 it says, And he has said to me, Oh, that's not up there. Wait. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, this is Paul speaking, who, last time I checked, most people sort of put on a bit of a pedestal as far as Bible people go. <laughs> A sort of forefathers in the Bible of people to look up to. People generally put Paul relatively high. But he was he was basking in his weaknesses here, fully aware that he wasn't necessarily this you know eloquent man. In fact, they I, I, I might be this is where my history. See, I'm no good at history. I feel like I haven't made this up. I'm looking at Todd for reassurance now. Is there a possibility that Paul wasn't particularly eloquent to the point that he might not have been able to write? And that's why other people wrote the letters for him. Um, he did occasionally say that he wrote certain things in his own hand. Um, but they but weren't sure whether it was a, an, an ailment that meant he couldn't, something yeah, like that, write. It's, po it's possible. There was a reason why Paul basically had help writing letters. So we have these amazing books of the Bible that we use as huge foundations for our faith. That might not have actually even been, they were written, and they were worded so, from, spoken from Paul, but they might not have actually been written down by him, because he might not have been capable. But we take these letters as like, rightly so, as this amazing word of God. So it's not about how eloquent you are, it's not about how academic you are, it's not about, you know, how brainy you are, or how many degrees you've got, or what your job looks like, or any of those things. God uses our weaknesses and gives us his strength through the power of his Holy Spirit to do the things he's called us to do. So you don't even have to feel like you're ready to do it. Do you think Todd and I wake up most days and go, yes, we're totally ready to run an international ministry? No. He might. I don't. <laughs> he's like, no. <laughs> 
It's not something you wake up and go, today I feel like I can do an international ministry. No, you don't. You just feel like it's completely out of your depth all of the time. It is completely insurmountable. And only, only by the grace of God can we do it. I stood in our kitchen at five o'clock last night going to Todd. I have absolutely no idea what to preach on tomorrow. Like, no idea. Like, nothing. Nada. I had sat all afternoon and read stuff and was reading things on the internet, trying to like delve into different, and all I got was nothing. Like, <laughs> so I went to the kitchen and started making dinner. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I literally don't know what to do. And then in the process of talking it out, God started to speak to me about what it was I needed to do. But this isn't about having these it all sort of lined up and being completely like, I am fully equipped and I'm fully gifted to do all these things. No, I feel like a weak mess 99% of the time. But it's not about me. It's about me moving myself out of the way and all of that crap, pushing it all out of the way and allowing God to use me in whatever that looks like. And he'll use me the same this morning as he will this afternoon, as he will tomorrow morning when I go back to work. And I don't know what that looks like. Watchman Nee said this, outside of Christ, I am weak. In Christ, I am strong. That's what we have to remember. We can do all things through Christ has given us strength when we are in Christ. And then two weeks ago, Alison finished up the, the main bulk of the sermon series with I am a work in progress. And this is just a great reminder to all of us that we are a work in progress. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 19, it says this, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. This is one of my favourite scriptures. I learned this in the internship program and we used it a lot and we prayed it a lot over ourselves. And at first it was just like, but it, this is used as like an introductory statement in one of Paul's letters. And you kind of think, well, what's the point of that? But ask that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. And that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. That is a prayer you can pray every day of the week. Because it's, it gives us that understanding. It's asking God to reveal to us what he wants us to do and how he wants us to do it. And more of who he is. And if we have that, that's the foundation to it all, really. And he does open the eyes of our heart. He has to reveal those things to us. We are a work in progress. We're not supposed to have everything figured out right at the start. There's no timeline but we should be moving forward. And that's crucial. There is no like, well, I should have my ducks in a row in six months. Or by the end of the sermon series, I will never ever think poorly of myself again. This is not the timeline. But we have to be moving forward. We have to be making progress. And you have to keep asking yourself, am I doing that? And if the answer is no, then things need to change. You need to pray, you might need to get into your word, you might need to talk to some other people, you might just need to tell somebody. You might just need to say, you know, actually, I feel I'm ground to halt and someone else might be able to cheer you on. We should feel like we're moving forward. It doesn't have to be huge strides. It's just forward progress. <laughs> So how is it going for you? 
Are you able to see progress? What are some of the areas that felt uncomfortable when we reviewed this sermon series? This many whirlwind through the sermon series. What were the areas that made you feel uncomfortable? Was there any? Because they're probably the areas that you need to work on. Those ones that made you feel a little like you wanted to shift in your seat a little bit. Like, okay, that's really awkward. Why are you talking about that? <coughs> When we were putting together this sermon series, I wanted to find a list of the I am statements of God. And there are hundreds, I'm sure. Um, and I found this one by Joyce Meyer, and it is very comprehensive. Um, and it's a list of the I am statements with their Bible references. So I wanted to put this together. We've never done this before. Um, I wanted to give this to each one of you. And so you can take it home and either pin it somewhere, put it in your Bible, put it by your bed, whatever, somewhere where you can reference it. Or you can put it in a stash of papers and then in about six months you'll go through them and you'll find them. You go, oh, that was really useful. You just find that. That's just me. I do that. Um, but maybe this is something you can read through. It doesn't tell you two sides. It's not the whole book. This is 20 pages, don't worry. <laughs> so there's two sides of it. But read through them. And keep reading through them. And keep reading through them. And keep reading through them. Until they become a reality in your life. Because this is so crucial to our walk with the Lord. This understanding of who we are. And really understanding our Christian identity. Because it is what we need to equip us in the fight. You cannot stand on the truth of God's word of who you are if you don't know what that says. You can't move forward if you don't think you're worth it. If you don't think you're good enough. If you don't think God values you. If you don't think God can use you. I want us to leave with just a few of the I am statements. Um, the light of God's truth has shone in my heart and given me the knowledge of salvation through Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 4 6. I hope that's what this sermon series has done. That it has shone on the Bible and reflected that knowledge and understanding of who God is. Christ lives in me and I live by faith in him and his love for me. Galatians 2.20 And I am called to live a holy life by the grace of God and to declare his praise in the world. And again, that doesn't have to look like a big international platform. You can declare his praise in the world in a thousand little ways. Because you never know one conversation with somebody could completely change their day. Could completely change their mind. You never know what your encounter with them might mean. I am greatly loved by God. And there are just four scripture references there. Four of many. So I'm going to end there, but I do ask you to continue to pray and to challenge yourself and ask yourself, how is it going and where am I at? And then to continue to press into those areas that you know you need God to speak to you in and to work in. And if you want one of us to pray with you or you want um, just a little bit of extra support in that, please come and say something. Please come and talk to us. Don't be isolated and don't think that everybody else has got it and you haven't because that's a lie. We're stepping away from the lies and we're walking into the truth. And we're going to sit in that place of understanding who we really are in Christ. And then living that out.